Hey, I'm Corny Rample, and we are here with the, I'm going to say stepbrother, but Elvis would have said brother, uh, Billy Stanley. Billy, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Corny. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a lot of people that don't know that Elvis actually had three guys that he called brother, uh, the Stanley brothers. Uh, tell us about that year that you, uh, your mom married Elvis's dad. Yeah, that was in uh, July third, nineteen sixty. But we were we were at Graceland. We actually got to Graceland shortly after Elvis came out of the army, which was in March of nineteen sixty. So a couple of weeks later, because I remember being there when he was doing the interview uh, after he came out of the army. My brothers and I were playing outside while he was inside doing an interview. So, uh, but they didn't get married because they were, you know. My mom and dad were going through a divorce, so they was waiting to get all that finalized and everything like that. And once that w- it was finalized, then they got married. Yeah, so, yeah, we were there at Graceland before, uh, you know, in in 1960. Now, when we first met him, we had no idea who he was, and I mean by that because I was a military brat, we we didn't really we had a radio, but we never li- listened to any Elvis songs, and you know we didn't have a TV set. And so I never, and plus I never really saw any movies growing up. Uh, basically, what I, all I knew when I was, you know, like six years old, was uh, I could tell a guy's rank by looking at his uniform. I knew all that, but I didn't know anything else. Right. Uh, and and Elvis had just come out of the army, didn't he? Yes. When you first met him. Yes. So yeah, tell uh, us about the day that you first met Elvis Presley. What was okay. that like? Uh, my brothers and I, we, they were, they had us in a boarding school while my, my mom and Vernon were getting things ironed out about what they were going to be doing with the divorce and all this stuff. So that was in Newport News, Virginia, and they came and got us. And on the way there, all we kept hearing about was this new guy that was coming in our life named Elvis. And, you know, we just, I, here again, I'm seven years old, so it's kind of hard to impress somebody, you know, seven-year-old about Wow, this guy's really, you know, he's this, this, and this. And I, okay, I don't know what that means, but it sounds nice, you know. So we get to Graceland. It was at night. Uh, we were actually asleep. So they wake us up. Uh, my mom and Bernard wake us up and say, You're home. And that's just as we pulled up to the gates and he honked the horn. And when he did, that gates opened up and we drove through those gates for the first time. And it was at night and it was all lit up. The only thing I could equate it to, and I, I, every time I think about that night was now I did see a little bit of TV when I was in the boarding school. It was uh, the wonderful world of Disney, you know, the castle. That's what it looked like when I first saw Grace and I just, wow, uh, this looks like a castle, you know, because I've never seen a house that big. I'm, I'm used to army barracks, you know, or, or apartment, that stuff. So I see it, and I, I even ask. I said, does a king live here? And Bernard said, well, you know, a lot of people call him a king. So we go in, we go up, pull around the back, and go in the house. And Bernard said, ask, uh, where's Elvis? And he said, uh, he's downstairs. He's waiting on y'all. So we get downstairs, and he's shooting pool. Now, when I, we go down the stairs, and we take the right. And it was so crowded, we, could, I could, we couldn't see anybody who was there. All I heard was a little voice or, well, not a little voice, but a voice that said a ball in a corner pocket. The next thing I heard was, you know, the, the ball hitting the ball. And I, I guess he made it because everybody, yeah, Elvis, hey. So as soon as that happened, then it kind of parted. The crowd did. And I look, I'm looking at him and I, I'm just a seven year old kid, but I'm just getting this great vibe by looking at him going, wow, this guy's neat. And he smiles at us and puts his pool cue down and walks over. And he, he looks down. And he said, what have we got here, Daddy? He said, these are your new little brothers, Elvis. And he picked, reached down and picks all three of us up at once and said, Daddy, I always want a little brother. Now I got three. Wow. That's how it started. <laughs> oh, that must have been just uh, just incredible. And I understand that Elvis liked to buy you a lot of toys, too. Well, I, I didn't know it. At the, we didn't know that at the time. Uh, he After we talked for a few minutes, then he dismissed everybody. You know, he told, you know, my mom and dad, you know, I'm sure you're tired. Go do what you're going to do. And then he told everybody else, you know, you guys go do something. I'm going to sit here and play with my brothers for a little while. And so he was talking to us, you know, 
as I look back, you know, he's asking us what kind of toys we liked and this and that. And we were telling him and, you know, I was kind of interested in the pool table, you know, and I was asking him about that. And he goes, I'll teach you how to play someday when you get a little taller and you can see up over it. And I said, okay. And then uh, he tucked us into bed that night. And the next thing I know is it, he comes, I, he, I didn't know he wasn't a morning person, but the next morning he comes running in. It was like a fire drill. Got to get up. Got to get up. We was, we was looking, didn't know what to do. And so we start looking for our clothes. We got our pajamas on. He said, you don't have time for that. Come on. So he takes, he picks David, the youngest up uh, and puts him on his shoulders and takes me and Rick by the hands. And we go out to the backyard. And when we get there, there's this big stack of toys. I mean, a real big stack of toys, three of every kind of toy you can think of, because he didn't want us arguing over, this is mine, that's mine. No, he got three of every toy there was. And I was sitting there, and I'm holding holding his hand. I look up at him. I said, whose are those? He said, they're yours. I said, can we play with them? <laughs> he laughed. He said, yes, they're yours. So we spent the rest of the day playing with our new toys with Elvis. So that's uh -huh. how he welcomed us to the family. That's just incredible. And so this was 1960. You're right. seven years old. Um, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but you you were in Elvis's life for 17 years before he passed. Is that correct? Yes. I was with him from, from the time I was seven until I was, tw until I was 24 when he passed away. So you grew up in Graceland? Yes. Well, that Graceland was my home. That We lived there for about a year and a half, almost two years mm -hmm. when we first got there. You know, I just seen this recent video on YouTube. I, I, you know, I, I look at this stuff on YouTube and, you know, I said, this is clickbait. Somebody posted, said the secret annex. And I went, see, that's not a secret. That's the apartment Elvis had built for us to live there. Because <laughs> we were staying in, uh, we, we stayed in grandma's room for a while until they got the apartment built. And then that's where me, Ricky and David lived is out in the apartment. And how long did you live there? Uh, well, let's see. Like I said, up until about 62. Okay. So almost two years. So you got Elvis as a yeah, I'm going to school in a pink Cadillac. <laughs> so well, how many that, people can say that? <laughs> didn't Elvis drive you to school sometimes? Didn't he pick you up from school once in a while? Yeah, he picked me up when, a, a couple of times. But the first time was the most memorable because here again, I didn't know who he was. And, you know, I mean, I heard people at school uh, when I, because I started school immediately when we got there because I was in school. I was in the first grade. So I was going to school and Vernon would take me in in the various cars. But you know, usually he'd, you know, he would say the pink car and I'd know what car that was. So um, one day I came out and there was just a crowd of people. I mean, the students, their parents and teachers, too, you know, it was like. What is this all about? So I walk out. He sees me. He kind of open. He sees me and he open, reach out, open the door. I get in. He said, "How was school?" I said, "It was great." I said, "What are you doing?" He said, "I'm signing autographs." I said, well, "What's that?" He said, "Oh, that's where you put your name on a piece of paper." Up. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm. I still don't understand what's going on. And then uh, he's, he asked some of the kids. You know, people. He said, "Would you like to have Billy's autograph too?" And there were some squeals. Yeah. Okay, you know, so I reach in my book bag and I pull out a red crown and he hands me this piece of paper and I, I'm learning how to write. So I put Billy on there and I hand it back. And so this went on for about 10 or 15 minutes. And then Elvis said, I, I'm sorry, you know, Billy just got out of school. As you all know, it, uh, I need to take him home so he could eat and do his homework. So as we're driving away, I, I, I'm, I'm curious as to what what was this all of? Why was everybody doing this? And. I just kind of looked at him and I said, are you famous or something? He laughed and said, well, some people think I am. And I couldn't equate it. And I'm trying to think of somebody famous. So I just said, are you more famous than Mickey Mouse? And he laughed. He said, well, some people think I am. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll get daddy to, I'll get daddy to play some of my records and show you some of the movies I've done. And all I said was neat. And he just reached over and pulled me over next to him, you know, and we drove to Graceland. Oh, wow. Because I mean, we, my brothers and I, we didn't know who he was. We were the only ones that probably came into his life not knowing who he was. Everybody else did. Yeah. And I'm sure so a lot they, of He saw that bond form right there. You know, that's okay. These kids don't know who I am. They don't know I'm a big this, this, and this. Yeah. And so that's how our relationship was. And because when I got older, it was just like, uh, that's just Elvis. You know, that's yeah. my brother. Well, a lot of people that entered his life entered him because of who he was. Right. Where you were just a couple of kids. This is your new brother. Let's do life. Like this is. 
Welcome this to my really world. <laughs> Here it is. World, there you go. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, we're going to talk about your book in just a bit. I'm very excited to read The Faith of Elvis, a story only a brother can tell. Uh, when was the first time that that you actually felt like a brother? Because when you met him, he was a stranger who was, man, this guy's nice. But at what point did you really feel that connection that this is my brother? Um. I, I would say that, that that night he picked us up and said, Daddy, I always want a little brother, and I got three. Because I felt it right then. I mean, when I saw him, I knew there was something different about this guy than I've ever – I hadn't met a lot of people, man. I'm only seven years old. But yeah. there was just something about this guy that was just so – I thought, he's just like me and Ricky and David, except he's taller than us. He was like a ki big kid to us. And my brothers and I, we gave him an excuse to be a kid again. Mm, yeah. And what he – you know, and he said it many times when we were growing up, you know, I want to make sure I heard him, you know, people might say something. He said, I'm going to make sure my boys are taken care of. I want them to experience the things I didn't get to when I was a kid their age. And he did. You know, he, you know, now, I wouldn't say he spoiled us. Yeah, I would. He did. <laughs> <laughs> You're Elvis' yeah. brother. You got you know, but Vernon tried to keep it. It was, they were, that's the yin and yang right there. Vernon was the strict disciplinarian and Elvis was Elvis. I mean, he was just this kind, loving, sweet individual that, you know, that cared about three little boys that he saw that we were scared and we didn't know what was going on. We had no idea. I mean, he could sense that fear in us because we were just kind of like, this is all, you know, this is new and big and everything is fantastic. And But he made it like a smooth transition for us. Yeah. And I mean, it was, but I, I think what, the, the 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 question everybody usually asks is when did I realize who Elvis was, mm. and I and that didn't happen. I mean, now I saw a concert in 1961, was my first concert, but I it scared me. I didn't understand what it was all about because I'm sitting there, and we're it's all quiet, and we was at the Ellis Auditorium, and we had it like this balcony seat, and we're just sitting there, and I'm we're looking over the balcony. My brothers and I go, wow, oh, remember that's a lot of people. And as soon as he hit that stage, all these people started screaming and running toward the stage. And we didn't know what it was all about. It kind of scared us. And so we was even talk, we talked to him after the show. We was back at Graceland. And he he talked to everybody. Everybody was talking about how great the show was and blah, blah, blah. And he finally worked his way over to where we was at. And then he said, what did you think about that? And we just said, why was everybody screaming and yelling? And he said, well, that's <laughs> what they do if they like you. And I said, well, they must love you because they were screaming and yelling. <laughs> oh, so, I love it. And in 1969, we saw him perform live. I mean, we saw the, the singer special, which came out in 1968. I mean, that was televised. It, it, I mean, it was, it was good, but it didn't capture the essence of Elvis. Mm. You know what I mean? You only got that if you saw him live. Right. I'm yeah, because it was there. produced. Yeah. yeah. I was, I'm was. i sitting there. I didn't want to be there. I'm 16 years old. And I go, okay, this is just my older brother playing. You know I mean? You know, I, I know what he does now for a living and all this. And I, I understand he, you know, he's he's big in the industry and stuff. But I wanted to be at Woodstock. But the family said, nope, you're going with us. This is a family vacation this year. I said, okay. So I'm sitting there going, well, all I'm going to see is a bunch of old people and this and that. I'm sitting there and I'm looking, I'm seeing celebrities and different, very all ages of people. I'm going, oh, okay, this might be different. He come out on that stage. I think I took one breath during the whole show. My jaw had to drop and hit the table. And my brothers and I were looking at each other like, who is this guy? We'd never seen him before. <laughs> I know why they call him the king of rock and roll now, too. Yeah, and I mean, I got to say, I've seen a lot of concerts. I mean, being Elvis's brother, I was privy to see a lot of, I mean, just about any major groups that came through Memphis and stuff. I saw, you know, Leonard Skinner, the Stones, you know, you name it, I saw them. And, but nobody come close to this guy. Yeah. Just, oh, my God. Now I know why they call him the king of rock and roll. Yeah. And it was like, because I even said, Man, I never. Who is this guy, Elvis? He said, "Billy, it's only starting. Wait, it, yep. you know, it's get ready for one heck of a ride that's coming up." Yeah, and it was. Well, yeah. You grew up with him, 
uh, and, and this is like from childhood into your teenage years, into your adult years, you went to go work for him. You were, how old were you when, did, when you went to go work for him? 19. 19. So there yeah, had now to... my brothers, Rick and David started before I did. Okay. I was a homebody. I really didn't, I never really thought about working for Elvis. I, I, when I say work for Elvis, I did in a sense that I was kind of like a groundskeeper and stuff because Vernon didn't get, believe in allowances and stuff. So he said, no, you're going to work. I remember yeah. the first time I asked him for an allowance, I was like 13 years old because all the kids at school was bragging. Oh, yeah, I get this for an allowance, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so I went to him and asked him, he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, I'll get you a lawnmower and you can mow these yards around the neighborhood. And he said, there's your allowance right there. I said, okay. <laughs> your allowance is you're allowed to go to work. <laughs> Pardon me? Your allowance is you're allowed to go to work. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, and I'm glad he did that. You know, he, he, a lot of people ask me about Vernon and Vernon was, he was strict and he was hard, but he was fair. And I mean, he taught me the value of working hard. And I mean, he, he, one of the things he instilled in me when I was just starting in the workforce is a lot of people are going to look at you, Billy, because they know who you are and they're going to say, you got this job because who you're related to. He said, you have to show them you got the job because you're capable of doing it and you do it better than anybody else. Mm. And that's, that was always been my mindset from, from that day on, whenever I got a job, and whenever I did, that's the way I was. That's the way I applied myself. I was there early and I left late. So tell me about the times when Elvis got you out of trouble. Cause I know there were some times you guys probably got in trouble together, but tell me about a time that you remember where Elvis got you out of a jam or, or got you out of some trouble. Well, the first time I remember was my brothers and I were playing around Elvis's motorcycle. And this is 1960. He had his Harley sitting in a carport. We wouldn't touch it because we were told not to. I mean, my brothers and I, we mind when Vernon said something or anybody that was older than us, we respected our elders. That's the way we were raised. And we said, yes, sir. No, sir. And so we said, you know, they, they said, don't touch this motorcycle. Yes, sir. So we was just playing around it. And it was in the summertime and it was in the Memphis, it gets very hot. And, and the asphalt, it that, kickstand just sank down and it finally fell over. Vernon came out and saw it and he was about to give us a whipping and Elvis just happened to be walking out. He said, whoa, whoa, what's going on here? He said, these boys were playing with a motorcycle and it fell over and they said, he looked at us, he said, is that true? And we said, no, we didn't touch it. It just fell over. Elvis looked at Vernon and said, you're not going to whip my boys. They didn't touch it. Now, wow, <laughs> can you be around all the time? <laughs> <laughs> Because, uh, you know, Vernon was one of those uh, 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 that, you know, spare the rod and spoil the child. You know, yeah. he whipped us, you know, it, it didn't warp us or make us this or that. You know, I mean, you know, it's, you know. And it was a different time. It was a different, it was a different time. time back then. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, I, sometimes I deserved it, you know. But uh, that was the first time. I mean, uh, I heard a story he was there about uh, Elvis going um, into the. Now, I, I'm probably just hearing little snippets of it, but but one of you had been picked up by the police for something. Yeah. And, well, and, a, and I, went in the back door to help you out. T tell me about that. Yeah. Well, what happened was uh, me and a friend of mine were riding around, and he'd been doing some iron work at these apartments. And we had our dates, and he, we, he, we, he was driving us around the apartments, and then he got this bright idea. He was going to jump this curb and go up by the pool, and show us the ironwork they did around the pool. Well, the, the people that lived there saw us. And so he took off. And they started chasing us, actually. So we went down one street, thought, okay, well, it's all clear. And we goes down and we come back and they're all standing across the street. And I just said, whatever you do, Ted, don't stop. Don't stop. So he guns a little bit. And this guy's got a brick. As we go by, he hits the windshield and the whole windshield just caves in on us. And so we go to his house and, you know, he, he, he tells his dad what happened and dad gets mad. Okay. We're going to go find out what happened here. And so we all get in the car and then we stop at this bar. This is, <laughs> uh, and get, pick up some friends. Cause we said, well, there's, I, we kept telling Ted's dad, there's a lot of them. There's at least 20 of them. So, and there was a few friends with us. We picked them up. There was maybe six or seven that went with us. Okay, we're going to take on 20 guys. Yes, we're going to take on 20. 
if it came to that. So we get there and I'm thinking, well, we're just going to pretty much kind of talk this out. And we get there and they're standing around kind of where we was at before by the pool. But we stopped the car. We didn't pull up there this time. And Ted gets out and said, there they are. And as soon as he said that, everybody just ran and a big fight just broke out. It was it looked like something you'd see in a Western movie. It was just everybody's hitting people and people. And this guy comes up, this older guy comes out and he's got a gun. And this friend of mine standing there saying, he's as uh, nothing but blanks. And the guy shoots it in the ground and dirt flies up. Well, somehow he tripped. And when he did, my friend kicked him in the face. And, and here's the fight starting all over again. And we heard sirens. So we just scatter. <laughs> we took off. And I would probably got away, but my friend was running barefoot. And we was running through this field. And I didn't, I cleared it, but there was this little two inch thing of uh, concrete slab and he hit it barefoot he hit the ground and i heard him hit the ground and yell so i stopped and when i did that's when the flashlight hit me and said stop okay you got me so they took us in and uh, uh my brother rick saw was there he pulled up just as we they was putting me in the squad car and he said i'll tell elvis <laughs> and the cop kind of looked at me like what oh. And I didn't say anything. I was just holding my head down. I was, you know, ashamed of myself. Um, later on, uh, I'm sitting in the cell. And next thing I know, Billy Stanley. I reached my hand out down here. And I come and get me. And then they come and get me. And Red West was there. Now, Rick told me that uh, Sonny, they had to wake him up. This was about 2 o'clock in the morning. Wake him up and go down there. He woke, First, he told Elvis. And he said, I'm going to send Sonny down there to get you, get him. So Sonny gets dressed and he's, of course, you know, grumpy and everything. He gets there and you know, he's talking to the guy and they you, used to have a little hole, you know, glass right here in a little hole they would talk through. And the guy said, no, nah, we're not, we're, we're going to keep him. We got him for attempted murder and stuff like this. Sonny reaches through there and grabs the guy and says, you're going to get him out right now. And Sonny shows his badge. Go get him now. Pushes him back. Okay. They get me out. And so I tell Elvis what happened. He said, okay, I'll take care of this, you know, the next day. So we go to court and I got two judges as my attorney. <laughs> I'm sitting there and I, they said, Billy Stanley. I said, yes, sir, right here. And he said, come here. Don't you say a word. You, we'll, we'll do the talk. And so they said, they called me up and I'm standing there with the two judges. And they said, uh, they looked at the judge and they said, this is our client here, uh, Mr. Presley's uh, brother dismissed and they found out later that all charges were dismissed because what they did was you know they were the ones that instigated this whole problem i mean you know the whole fight and everything else they were the ones that, you know when they threw that brick through the windshield that was it yeah you know so everything was everybody got dismissed and you know it was like i, I was scared to death you know because they attempted murder no, no that's not what we were doing we was just fighting that's all uh, and, you know, I just I went to him and thanked him and I said, thank you. Elvis. He said, just don't, he said, Billy, there is such a thing as called being at the wrong place at the wrong time. He said, that's all it was. Don't make it any more than it is. Just be careful what you do from now on. And so I've always been. That was a lesson learned right there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so many moments about Elvis's life that we hear and we think are like, wow. But you were there for a lot of them. Like. Were you there when, uh, for example, when the Beatles met Elvis? W were you there? No, I was in, we were in school. I mean, that, that happened in L.A. Now, the Beatles came by my house when they played here in Memphis in 1966. They just stopped in. Well, they, well, what they did was they were playing in Memphis that night. Elvis was in L.A. doing a movie, but they just happened to be doing a concert here in Memphis. And they wanted their pictures taken at the front of Graceland. So they stopped at Graceland and the guard said, you need to go over and ask Mr. Presley if you, if, you know, if they'll let you go up there and take your pictures. So they came by and this is about dinner time because we were sitting down to dinner and I heard a knock. And since I was the oldest when Bernard said, OK, Billy, go get the door. So I go open the door and I'm standing there and I, there's this guy standing in front of me. He said, hello, is Mr. Presley here? I said, yes. I said, he said, well, my name is Brian Epstein. I'm the road manager for the Beatles. And when he said that, I kind of leaned like this to see, and I saw the limousine and I saw the Beatles looking out the window. And I just, 
I'm trying to be cool. I go, okay, uh, I'll go tell them you're here. I close the door, and as soon as I close the door, I go running in and out. The Beatles are here. The Beatles are here. <laughs> now, six months earlier is when John made that statement. We're more popular than Jesus. Right. If he had kept his mouth shut for just six months, I could have met him right there. But my mom said, nope, you boys aren't going to go meet him. Go up to your room right now. Mom, it's the Beatles. I don't care who it is. You go upstairs. So we went upstairs. And my bedroom window just happened to overlook the, the driveway where they were sitting. And we're just sitting there looking at them. And Bernard gave them permission to go over there and, you know, get their pictures taken. I'm just going, man, that close. That close to meeting them. If John had just kept his mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that would be nice. I, I, I kid around and say, didn't the Beatles come to everybody's house? You know, yeah. I thought, I thought they did. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about when uh, when Elvis went to go meet up with Nixon? Were, were you part of Because you were working for him at that time, weren't you? No, I wasn't. I was, let's see, that was in 1970. I didn't start okay. working to, for Elvis until 1972. Okay, so were you brother? my brother Rick was had started. He took, he, he, Elvis took all three of us out of school. And, you know, now it was kind of against my mom's wishes because she said, Elvis, I want them to go to college. You know, I want them to be doctors and lawyers. He said, doctors and lawyers. I have doctors and lawyers working for me. Yeah. He said, I'll give them an education they'll never forget. And he was right. But anyway, that, that whole thing about Nixon, it was just on a whim. And how it actually started, because I was sitting in the house that night, is just before Christmas, a couple of weeks before Christmas. And him and Priscilla had gotten into a disagreement about something, because I heard them in there, and, you know, they was kind of going back and forth. And he said, fine, I'm out of here. And he closed the door. I kind of go, what happened? I guess he's gone for a ride. Yeah, he went for a ride, all right. He rode down to the airport. He didn't have any money on him. He just walked into the counter and said, can I get, can I write you an IOU? And they said, yeah, where do you want? He said, I'm going to go to Washington, D.C. Now, he went to Washington, D.C., and while he's on there, he writes this letter to Nixon that he wants to get him a DEA badge. And that's and that's how it all started. It wasn't plant, premeditated or anything. It was just that happened, and that's where he ended up going. Yeah. Now, what happened? What the funny thing was is, I was talking to him about it when he came back. I said, "So, what was it like meeting Nixon?" He's, oh, he's okay. He said, uh, "I was looking at, it was, I was in the Oval Office, and I was looking at a painting of Washington." And uh, Nixon came over to me, and I said, "Yeah." He said, um, "I said, Elvis said, well, I, I was talking about the painting. I said he sure dressed kind of funny, and." Nixon looked at him and said, well, I could say the same thing about you, Mr. Presley. And Elvis looked at him and said, sir, you got your show to run? I got my show to run. <laughs> I said, you said that to Nixon? He said, yeah. <laughs> Only Elvis would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the president. But, well, he's, but you know, he could do it. Yeah. Well, you must hear stories all the time about Elvis. Uh, but have you ever heard a story where someone's, you know, t telling a story around you, but they don't know who you are? Oh, they yeah. Don't you're Elvis's brother, and they're spoken <laughs> off and go, hang on. Has that ever happened? Oh, lots of times. Uh, the, one of the funniest ones was I was sitting there. I was talking with a friend, and he introduced me to this friend of his. He said, uh, did you know Elvis? Oh, yeah. I used to go up to the house all the time back in the 60s, and he and I would sit and drink a case of uh, Pat's Blue Ribbon beer all the time. Had a, had a delivery truck bring it up there every day. And I just... I'm sitting there because my friend knew who I was, but this his friend didn't. And I'm sitting there just smiling, shaking my head. I said, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> and he walks <laughs> off. He said, what do you think about that stuff? I said, man, I hear it all the time. You know, you know, I, I, had, I have an uncle that worked at a gas station that knew a friend uh, years back that did this and this and this. You know, I just, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, yeah, I hear it all the time. It's, it's funny. I, I just kind of smile and go on. I don't, it, I don't reveal who I am. Is it weird touring Graceland for you? Like, this was your old home. This is where your memories are. The, is it strange when you're there and there's tourists? Well, I remember when it was quiet. I mean, I remember when it was a home, not a tourist attraction. I mean, when Elvis was there, that house would take on a, its own life. I mean, you could, t you could sense Elvis's presence was so strong that people didn't know he was home or not, but they could feel it. And they would just start stopping at the gate. I mean, yeah. it wasn't like, 
all of a sudden there's a bunch of cars at the front of that door. No, they were always a bunch of doors, but they knew there was something. They knew that he was home. That's how strong his presence was. Mm -hmm. You know, when he wasn't there, people wouldn't stop. I mean, people would stop and take pictures. Don't get me wrong. But there would be more people gather when he was there. And it was like, how do they know? Because they're not announcing it on the radio that Elvis is home or anything like that. They just start coming. And I just thought that was wild. But as far as I like going through Graceland, I love taking people through this never been through before. Or, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's always loved Elvis and they want to hear a real, some real good stuff. I go, well, I'll take you through Graceland. Let me, I'll, come on, I'll come to Memphis. I'll take you through there. I'll give you a tour that you'll never forget. And I mean, I, the VIP like tour people, you know, they, I've had one of them reach out and say, don't say who I am, but could you give me a little a few nuggets to share with people? I'm like, no, why? <laughs> you guys don't want me around up there anyway. What do you mean? <laughs> You're going to ask me for advice. <laughs> no. So I take people through. Yeah. And, uh, you really used to bother me. You know, the, the only part that really bothered me up for a long time, up until a few years ago, was standing at the gravesite. Mm. That, that I mean, that was the hardest thing in the world for me to do. But when I had that uh, near death experience and saw Elvis in heaven, that's when I said, you know, it, it got so easier for me now because I love going through there because I know where he's at. You know, I mean, I, I've always been raised that way as a Christian and everything like that. But I was also a realist, you know, just kind of like, well, I, I believe it, you know, but it'd be nice to see it. Well, I saw it. <laughs> and you write uh, it's, a it's in your book, which I think is fantastic. And we're we're going to get to that in, in just a minute. And yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm I'm so looking forward to reading your book. Um, but now, I just, I, I just kind of brought that up because you, you, when you talk about going through Graceland, it, it used to really bother me, that one part right there, standing there at the gravesite. Because, I mean... When, when I thought of Elvis back in the day, I could never put Elvis and the word death in the same sentence. Right. I always thought, I never thought of him dying before me or anything. I always thought he would outlive me and all this. And, you know, sadly it didn't happen. But, um, and, you know, for quite a while, I wouldn't go through Graceland, you know, because it was just, I, I even had to move from Memphis in mm -hmm. 1980 because there was just so many memories here that just every street I went down and, you know, I hear songs and stuff. It just brings back memories. I had to, I had to get away from it. Mm -hmm. so. so there's a lot of people around here that know that I'm an Elvis tribute artist. And I got a lot of friends yeah. that are Elvis tribute artists. Uh, what do you think of that world of guys getting on stage, pretending to be <laughs> your brother? Do you go well, to any of the shows? Here's, here's what I think. Uh, it was shortly after I started working for Elvis in 1972. I was, we were in LA getting ready to do Vegas. And for some reason I was outside and I saw this guy, I, I, the, you know, tri, I guess you call them tribute artists or impersonators was the word back then. Right. I'd never seen one. And I saw him standing at the gate and I went in and told Elvis, I said, Elvis, you got to see this, man. This guy, he's trying to dress like you, got a hair comb, sunglasses and all this stuff. He said, I got to see this. So he grabs his pistol. And I, well, and I mean, there's a lot of pictures online of us do, doing this, but he was security. I mean, yeah. Elvis, Elvis took security very seriously. John Lennon should have, but yeah, he thought everybody loved him. So, but anyway, back to the story. He took his pistol and we were walking up toward the gate and he sees it's going to be kind of harmless. So he kind of motions me with the pistol to come over and get it. So I kind of walk, take a few steps behind him and take it, put it in my, put it in the back of my pants. And we're standing there and we're talking, you know, to this guy. All right, he's talking. I'm just kind of standing there and watching and I'm listening. And so after about 10 or 15 minutes, Elvis said, okay, nice to meet you, son. You know, going back in the house. And so we're walking back toward the house and I said, what do you think of that? He said, sincerity is the sincerest form of flattery. And if a guy wants to try to make a living by doing what I do, more power to him, as long as they do it for the right reason. Yeah. And I said, I, I was about to say something. He said, you know, the fans, it's all about the fans. I said, yeah. Okay. And That's so if, exactly. they're, if they're about the fans, I'm all for it. But I've worked and been around a few that kind of carried that persona off the stage and thought they were the same. Oh, no, don't do that to me. And come up and say, little brother, uh-uh, don't say that to me. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> your brother, you know, uh-uh. Yeah. So, but, yeah, there's a place for them. 
Yeah, that's just it. I mean, I I don't look like Elvis. You know, I've, I look more like Jim Carrey's dad. You know, what I mean, like. I, <laughs> So, Looks like corny to me. So <laughs> that's right. But you know, when I when I when I put on the hair, I put on the costuming, and you know, get on stage, um, and and I just uh, all my all I want to do is just give the fans the experience of Elvis's music, the closest that they that I can give them of a live experience show with Elvis. Because other than that, it's videos of Elvis, which is of course much better than I can do on stage. But can, um, can I ask one question? Yeah. Why would you do that? Why would I do that? You know what? That's a great question. <laughs> I've always been a big fan, and I've always been, okay. uh, I've always done impressions and characters my whole life. When okay. I when okay. I would do my stand up stuff, I would do an impressions and characters, and people started saying, uh, "You got something in that Elvis voice. You should you should work on that." And and so I I rented my first costume, put on my first concert, and the phone hasn't stopped ringing for twenty three years. And I so competed for you're saying you can sound years. like Elvis. I can. <laughs> okay, let, let me hear. Let me hear you say something like Elvis. Oh, now, now here you go. Now, <laughs> <laughs> now you got to remember, I'm Canadian, and, and I'm also <laughs> Minnesota. <laughs> okay, Minnesota. Corey, you got me, buddy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a good that was, one, buddy. I like that. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, uh, but I but I'm such a fan of his music, and I love singing the songs that are Thank just um, on on the fringe of not the you know all the the, the mainstreams, the songs that were just like that was powerful. He sang it because he loved the song, and so many times I tell the audience, you know, Elvis sang the song just because he loved the song and wanted to share it. Yeah. and you know, and also being a Christian, um, and I know Elvis was too, and I know you are as well. You know, I I love that Elvis sang gospel music in his concerts because he did that i'm able to as a performer go to any venue as elvis and sing how great thou art stand by me peace in the valley like the songs that just touch people's heart i can sing the word of god in any venue yeah because Elvis did it well right? I mean, what most people the fans probably it probably went over their head is the message that he was trying to give them while he was doing that. I mean, because how many rock concerts you ever go to and all of a sudden in the middle of it, there's two gospel songs right there. Yeah. That's yeah. his way of letting you know, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian. That's yeah. all he was doing. Yeah. And I mean, in his gospel music, you know, there was a big difference. If you listen to any gospel song and then, I mean, which, and they even like, well, I would say Bridge Over Troubled Water, but the way he sang it was almost like a gospel song. Because it, if you listen to the words, it, mm -hmm. it's, it's really close. But just say hound dog or anything else, you know, there's a big difference in his voice. I, that's my new challenge since the book has come out. And when I'm doing interviews, I always say, okay, you pick out any Elvis song. I don't care which one it is. And then pick out a gospel song. Anyone, I don't care which one it is. And compare the two. Tell me which one you think was more conviction. Yeah. You can hear it in his voice. Yeah. I mean, well, people... One of the things I've noticed, <clears throat> and I even I, I even did this to my brother David. I said, you know, you know that YouTube footage of Elvis uh, doing uh, "Oh Holy Day," uh, yeah, "Oh Holy Day." I said, did you ever notice this? And I showed it to him. I said, you know, Elvis is just singing, and all of a sudden that Holy Spirit touched him, and then you could see it just the way he moved and how it all of a sudden the tone. And everything else changed in that whole song. Because at first he was just kind of going through it. And then that Holy Spirit touched him and you see it. And I mean, I get chill bumps when I think about it. And when I, I watch it quite a bit and I show it to people, they go, oh, Bill, I've never noticed that. Yeah. I said, well, yeah, what? You know, so I always issue that challenge. Go watch that oh, holy day and watch it. You'll see it when it happens. It just, ding, you know. And Elvis was a firm believer in the Holy Spirit now. I've had moments in my concerts where I'm singing a song and all of a sudden somebody's crying and I won't even know why. I don't know. It might, I was like, this, you know, there's not even a sad song. Why are they crying? One Christmas concert. I was, I was singing uh blue Christmas, yeah. right? And I have fun with it. Beautiful right. Song. I sang blue Christmas. And then um, I noticed a couple right in the front row was crying and i usually go into the audience when i'm singing that song i go walk around a little bit yeah. so i took the tension away from the couple because they were crying and after the show and they composed themselves after the song and they stayed for the rest of the concert and um 
I asked the person who hired me, okay, that couple in the front, why were they like they cried during Blue Christmas? They said um, a year ago their son had passed away in a car accident, oh. and their surviving son at the funeral, and it was right around Christmas time. He sang a very somber version of Blue Christmas wow. at the funeral. He said, "You'll be doing all right with your Christmas of white, but I'm going to have a Blue Christmas." I tell you, I can't. Yeah, you're getting me right now. <laughs> I can't sing that song the same ever again when no. I heard those words. Like God bless you. That's all I got to say, Corny. <laughs> God bless it, you for that. Move me. I appreciate that, Billy. I, I, I really do. Um, okay, let's shift gears. Okay. I'm sure everybody wants to know what you think of the Elvis movie. <laughs> I'm, I'm not gonna do, you know, we're okay. not going to do it for you, but I want to know what you did like and what you didn't like. The only thing I can say that I did like about it was Elvis is back in the media again. Mm. His name. The movie is, and, and I always say this before I go into this. It doesn't really matter what I think as long as the fans enjoy it. That's mm. that's the only thing that matters to me. I mean, I could sit and nitpick that movie for, from now until eternity, but I'm not going to do that. What got me what immediate the, the first turn off to me, and I because I sat there, I even walked in with my wife and I said, I'm walking in with an open mind. I'm forgetting that I'm Elvis's brother and I'm gonna go watch this thing. So I sit there and I was okay. But then when it had the way he talked to his mom cussing, he would never do that. Mm. The way it portrayed his dad. Vernon was a strong individual, a very, very loving father that would never sit there and go, what do you think we should do? You know, yeah. Are you kidding me? Oh uh, no, uh, uh. You know, and he wouldn't. Elvis would. That's the part that, that when I saw that right there, that's when I started. I withdrew immediately and went back to being Elvis's brother. I said, "This is not the Elvis I grew up with. He was a lot stronger than what they portrayed him. He was. A, he was probably one of the most strongest, fun-loving, indiv loving individuals I ever met in my life. And they they didn't come close to touching that." Mm. They showed him out to be this sad, pathetic character. And that's not Elvis. I'm telling you, he loved being Elvis Presley. And he did not beg somebody to come back um, after the divorce. Yeah. No, he did yeah. not do that. When that was, Elvis closed the door on somebody, that door stayed closed. Did they remain friends? Yes, because they had a daughter. But that was it. There, yeah. was, no, there was no love there after that. You Were know? there any moments that you think... Austin captured the character. Were there moments that you went, okay, I can see where he captured the character here. Nothing no. for you? Okay. Nobody will ever capture that. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, so let, let, I mean if I was, if they gave me $85 million, the first thing I would have to say is, okay, we're going to, I don't know if you saw this deep fake thing that they did on uh, America's Got Talent or something. That's the yeah. first thing I would do. Because when I look at Elvis, when I look at Austin, I don't see Elvis Presley. I right. see Austin. When I look at any, when I look at an ETA, I don't see Elvis. I see the ETA. Yeah, you're talking about a guy that was there for 17 years, every day, and I'm, no, that's not him. I'm sorry, that's not him. Yeah, I mean, and people say, well, you, they look like what Elvis are you looking at? I mean, do I have to show you a picture of the guy I grew up with? I mean, that's the Elvis I grew up with right there. You know, that's not. Yeah. No. Well, there were some aspects of it that I liked. In that, well, first of all, like you say, Elvis is back in the media. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, see, that's the biggest thing for me. I'm glad yeah. that, that, I mean, I'm so happy that that came about and that he's out. I mean, his name is relevant again. Yeah. I mean, it's always relevant in my life because, I mean, you know, every day I think about Elvis. Yeah. So he's always been relevant to me, but I'm glad to see the fans. And I'm glad that they got something that they could watch and enjoy. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, but I mean... When you start asking me now about what my thoughts are about the movie is because they, they made, you know, they made him into a sad character again, you know, and here again, you know, I mean, they I, I did like the rebellious side that they showed. Yeah, he was that. <laughs> he was definitely that, especially in the 50s. Oh, yeah. Because he I remember him telling me about 
him being, you know, popular in the fifties and stuff like that, you know, cause I remember when the Beatles come out, I was, you know, I was a big Beatles fan and I, uh, you know, was talking to him about it. And, uh, he said, Bill, he, I said, what do you think about them? He said, well, they're nice. He said, but he said, you know, you got to understand, you know, they're kind of just following in my footsteps. I said, what, what do you mean? He said, I started all this. And he said, Billy, when I came out, they thought I was the antichrist. I said, what? He said, I'm, I know Billy, I'm, I'm calm and, you know, compared to what they do today. He said, but, but I was the one that started all this stuff. And I, I said, you know, okay. And then I kind of started doing a little bit of history lesson myself, re researching. He was the first, you know, I mean, I didn't know all this when I came along and he would tell me stuff about his past. And I, I mean, I loved it when he'd tell me about the, uh, the rebellious rock and roller that he was, you know, I mean, especially even later on in life, you know, cause, uh, he would say, Billy, he said, do you think I got here by just listening to what everybody told me? He said, I stayed true to my heart. I didn't, you know, he said, I did every, the song my way fit him to a T. Yes, he did. Yeah. He did it his way. He took the blows. The record shows. I yeah. did it my way. Absolutely. And he loved that song so much that sometimes when people would say, hey, Elvis, how you doing? He'd got regrets. I have a few, but then again, few to, few, too few to mention. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, that, see that's the guy that they need to portray this happy that loved life to the fullest i mean he lived it to the fullest because he always told me billy he said you better enjoy it now because you don't come back for an uncle yeah but you better make the best of every day you got above the ground and he did i mean he he lived more in his 42 years than 100 people could in their you know 100 years yeah and, you know and, you know, God bless him. <laughs> you know, I love him. I mean, that's my, that's my big brother, you know. Tell me about the last time you were with your brother. That was August 14th, 1977. Two days before uh, he passed away. Uh, David and I had been out that day and we came in and we, we said, where's Elvis? And they said, oh, they're sitting in Lisa Marie's uh, nursery. Lisa wasn't in the nursery. She was at the grounds, but she wasn't up there. So they, they, it was Elvis and Charlie Hodge and Ricky. And I think Lamar was there. Mm -hmm. And so we went up just to see what was going on. And we, we started talking and he, sh he showed me these new karate knives he had. There were two of them. Oh man, those things that looks bad. Elvis, he said, let me give you a demonstration. All right. He said, and I throw a right. So I threw a right. And I said, he said, throw a left. And he showed me. I said, and I was just sitting there thinking to myself, it was surprising. And I just, what if somebody goes, and I did it. And when I did, he hit my finger, thankfully with the dull end of it. And so he drops the knives, you know, and just, oh God, you know, he thought he cut me. I said, no, no, it's just a big old blood buster, Elvis. He said, oh man, we got to take care of this. I'm, Elvis, it's just a blood buster. It's not a big deal. Okay. You know? He said, no, come on. So we walk, him and I walk into his bathroom. And I'm standing there looking at him in his, in his mirror going, if the world could see this guy making such a big deal out of just this little blood blister right here, you know, he's going, oh. Bro. He said, let me find a pen or something we can pop this with. I said, oh, we don't have to. It would be all right. He said, no, no, I want to take care of it. All right. So he comes back and he's got this little pen and he poured hot water over it. He said, I think we got it sterilized. I said, well, let's put a lighter on there too. You know, he said, I, I put my lighter out. He lighted up. He said, okay, now we got it. And he's holding my finger and I'm looking at him. He said, you want me to count? I said, no. He said, okay, one. And then he stabbed me and it popped it. You know, oh, okay. And so as we're standing there and the water's running over, he kind of looks at me and says, do you believe God forgives you for all your sins? And that caught me off guard because, you know, we're just, the blood blister and all of a sudden this comes up I was, yeah Elvis I mean we've talked about this for years you know that's what it says in the Bible if you know you confess your sins you know he forgives you he says good I just wanted to hear that from you I said okay so I I wanted to change that mood real quick so I started talking about football and everything else and so yeah we yeah what do you think the Browns are going to do and this and that and then he was then we I, I said we do you think you know what do you ever think I'll find anybody that I'll love? You know, I said, you know, it's, 
a lot of girls love to go out with me just because who I'm related to and stuff like that. He kind of looks at me, smiles. He said, just imagine what it's like being me. I said, oh, it's, I can't even imagine what that'd be like. He said, he said, one, he said, one day love is going to find you, Billy. He said, when it does, he said, don't mess it up like I did. And I was about to say, guess. He said, you'll never guess who it is. You don't even know. I said, okay. He said, it'll turn your world upside down. And he said, I, I messed it up myself a long, long time ago before, you know. So he was talking about the 50s, I guess. So um, I just sit there and said, you know, I said, well, what about, you know, the racing thing? He said that, he said, Billy, I've known that's been your dream all your life. He said, never give up on your dreams. He said, just pursue it. And with all you've got, never give up on it. And someday it'll happen. I said, okay. So we, that was pretty much it. You know, he just, I was about to leave. And he said, well, wait a minute before you go. He said, didn't you forget something? I said, um, I'll see you on the 16th. He said, now come here. He gave me a hug. I said, he said, I love you, Billy. I pat him on the back. I said, love you too, Elvis. And I walked, I was, I was walking down the stairs. He said it one more time. And I didn't say, I said, okay, I'll see you on the 16th. And I'm driving home and I'm thinking about this whole conversation that just took place. And then it, it, it hit me. He, he said he loved you and you didn't say anything. I hit the brakes and locked up the car, you know, slid off to the side of the street. And I said, the battle started going, well, should I go back now? Or, and then it, a voice just said, oh, you'll, you'll see him on the 16th. You can tell him then. Well, sadly, the 16th rolled around. I didn't get to see him. I regretted that. Yeah. Wow. You know, Billy, I, I did tell him while I was up there, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, and I, I tell you, I, I could hear these stories all day long, Billy. This has just been an absolute treasure. I want to talk about your book. Okay. You've finally written a book about your relationship with Elvis, but more importantly, Elvis's relationship with God, right. uh, faith of Elvis. Tell us about this book. Yeah, uh, it came out, let's see, October last year. And, uh, you know, I've, a lot of people, the fans think, uh, don't say anything to Billy. He doesn't listen. Yeah, I do. I've listened to all my, all my whole life. And, I, I, you know, finally, after the near-death experience, I said, okay, I'm gonna, I want to do a book. I want to do a book that every Elvis fan, when they read it, I want them to put it down and go, that's the best thing that's ever been done on Elvis Presley. And so far, I've, that's all what I'm getting. Because I want to give the fans back, you know, the man that it's always been my life mission since Elvis passed away to let the world know that this man was really a great man. I mean, not just a great entertainer, but he was a great human being also. His, him being a human, a being a Christian was just, and he was just as good as a singer as he was a Christian. Now, a lot of people say, well, Billy, he did this and this and this. Okay, now you're judging the man. Don't do that. You know, he, trust me, he asked for forgiveness. I've seen this guy get on his knees and pray for forgiveness. Now, imagine standing there or, and, or getting down on your knees with Elvis and praying. I've done that many times. And so this is the Elvis I wanted everybody to see. Because everybody's heard about, oh, he did this wrong. He did that wrong. Now, he didn't do a whole lot wrong in his life, except maybe... He believed in a couple of people like Colonel Parker, the guy with a hack to begin with. I mean, everybody kept saying, well, he made Elvis. No, he didn't. If he didn't, if he did, why didn't he make another one when Elvis passed away? He made Colonel Parker, you know, and they said, well, he is acting. Who else could pull off those silly movies but Elvis? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, what, his acting was excellent. Even, I mean, you hear some of these actors that worked with him and they always say he was a great actor, a talent that nobody really got to see. Because he wanted to do the dramatic roles and stuff like that. He wanted to be Dirty Harry, you know. And Chiro, they, he thought he was going to get a chance to be kind of like the spaghetti westerns. But what happened was Colonel Parker's infinite wisdom was instead of Elvis shooting the bad guy, he had to give him a dirty look. Now, Elvis told me this, and I watched the movie, and I see it, and I go, oh, it's just cringeworthy. When he, you can see he wants to pull that gun so bad, but all Elvis does is, Oh, oh man, he wanted, should have shot him. <laughs> wanted to keep that clean image, right? Yeah, this yeah. Clean image. Well, he, yeah. He could, I mean, you know, he wanted to do Stars Born. 
Yes. I mean, you know, Chris Christopherson, you know, he's 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 okay. You know, I mean, I, I'm I, I don't want to mean to be I'm not dissing Chris Christopherson, but Isn't if Elvis would have played that character, trust me, that character would have been a lot more believable, especially the singing part of it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay, now we got Chris Christopherson over here singing this song, and we got Elvis singing. Which one are you going to take? <laughs> yeah. Chris Christopherson is one Chris is a great writer. Don't get me wrong. I have nothing bad to say about, about Chris. But a singing battle between those two? Come oh. on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> wow. I think so, even a deaf person could figure out that one out, you know, which one is better. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I don't think he ever got the role that... Um, that that he should have gotten. He didn't get yeah, that break. He, he, I saw throwing. him. I saw him when he would he would watch a movie or something. If it moved him, he could memory. He had a memory that was unbelievable. He could sit and listen to it one time and then do it word for word. I mean, it's like it's you know, people talk about. I mean, for here's an example. Elvis wouldn't just sometimes read the Bible to us. He would act the character out when he's reading it. Oh, that okay. was a, now that's a Bible school lesson you never forget right there. <laughs> it was like, wow, okay. But see, that's that's the Elvis I want to introduce everybody to, the guy I grew up with. The 17 years of this man in my life, how great he really, really was. I mean, now, one of the things that happened before this book even came out, we were sitting talking to, I was talking to the publisher and the the ghostwriter and all this stuff. And the first thing they said, who do you want this? Who do you want to read this book? I said, Lisa Marie. And they said, what? I said, I want her, I want his daughter to read this book. So she'll know how great her dad really was. Well, why do you say that, Billy? I said, well, I can only go from this. A lot of stuff has been, I can't even tell you how many books have been written about him. I mean, if she ever read any of it, and all these movies or any of that stuff like that. I said, and plus she grew up, you know, with Priscilla, which is an ex-wife, which ex-wives talk about their ex-husbands. I mean, that's just the thing that happens now. And that's the way it is. And I, but I wanted her to get a different perspective on what her dad was really like. You know, I mean, from a brother's perspective of this is what he was really like, Lisa. So that's yeah. why it really, when it hit me, when I heard that she passed away, it, I mean, I withdrew. I, I mean, it, could, my, it was like I'm reliving the whole Elvis ex dying experience again. And I'm sitting there going, God, you know, I hope she got to read this or, you know, somebody told her about it or something. I mean, I, I get a little upset thinking about it because, you know, that poor little girl, you know, she didn't get the opportunity that my brothers and I did. I mean, she only had nine years. I had 17. I know her life would have been a whole lot different had he been around. You know, just God love her. Yeah. Yeah. Our, uh, wow. Our hearts broke for the whole family, including yourselves. Thank you. You know, when, when that happened. And uh, yeah. <clears throat> That's why I think this book is so important because, uh, you know, we do need to look at more. I know when, a, as an Elvis performer, I, I remember when I started, some people in my church said, you know, how could you as a Christian go and perform as this guy who, you know, women, yeah. drugs, blah, blah, blah. How could you? And I, 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 I looked this, this gentleman in the eye and I said, if you knew every sin I committed, if 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 every thing I ever did wrong was public, you would not let me sing in your church. You would not let me work in a Sunday school. You would actually probably campaign to get me kicked out of this church. So I, I never pretend to be better than anybody who has sinned as much as I have because we're all human. But the but the gospel side of Elvis and the you know the the faith of Elvis, that's what I think needs to be that's the story that needs to be told. And I'm so glad that you're telling this story, a story that only a brother can tell. Uh, where can we get a copy of this book, Billy? Uh, the, the best thing I tell people is just Google it, Google the title, and it should list a place someplace close to where everybody is, where they can buy it. You know, uh, I know Amazon's got it. I mean, you know, all your major bookstores, even Target, Walmart, I mean, they all have it. 
uh, you know, Barnes and Noble. But, um, you know, that, that point you was talking about talking to that Christian, you know, and I've had Christians talk to me since the book has come out, you know, say, well, how can you say this about Elvis? You know, I go, OK, let's let's delve into your past right now. OK, let's open. Let's take all the skeletons out of your closet. They go, never mind. I said, yep, just answer your own question. Yep. I said, a lot of this stuff, too, has been exaggerated. OK, yep. just so you know, everything that you've heard about Elvis is not true. Yeah. So, and, I oh, go, and they go, I, oh, well, I didn't know. That. I said, well, because you didn't ask the right person. Yeah, I've said that. I said, there's also another book you might want to pick up where it reads in there, Judge Ye, Lest Ye, not be, lest ye be Judged. Yeah, yeah. I remember that book. <laughs> I said, when, when did God appoint you his his attorney? Yeah. <laughs> oh, never mind. <laughs> okay. Oh man. Well, he he doesn't ever appoint anybody an attorney. And I said, there's that one little verse that you need to read over again because you're yeah. judging a man you don't know anything about. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You know, he lived uh, a very public life. His life was under a microscope. And but I no, tell people, no, his his, his yeah, because it, it, most people, are, you got me on that because most people say a magnifying glass. His was a microscope. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know? Every little thing, every little detail, if he did this or he did that. I mean, for instance, a lot of people talk about, you know, Elvis being drafted. There wasn't there wasn't a draft going on back then, you know, because I talked to him about it once, you know, about you was drafted. He said, yeah. Why do you think that was? He said, Billy, like I said, when I first came out, they thought I was an antichrist. They thought if they put me in the army for about two years, it'd be all over. We don't have to worry about this guy ever again. That's why he was drafted. Yeah. And they yeah. wanted to put him away. I mean, yeah. they had, he was telling me the FBI files that, you know, people, they were following him around and filming and waiting for him to do something wrong. You know I mean? And it, now there's two different versions of Elvis. Now. There was that fifties version, you know, and then the army version after the army version, where when he came back up, you didn't see him moving around. You saw the girls moving around. You know, they were doing the dance and he was just kind of standing there singing. <laughs> so you, you're seeing a watered down version. You know, he he, he learned his lessons. And, okay. You know, you got me, you know, I'll, I'll clean it up a little bit. So. <laughs> oh, Billy, this has been a treat for me to visit with you. Uh, I've been, I've been wanting to visit with you for a very long time. And I remember uh, back in the eighties, when I went to high school here in Manitoba, there was one of the Stanley brothers, and I don't remember if it was uh, Ricky or David. I don't. I think it was either Ricky or David was yeah. doing a tour, talking to schools about the dangers of drugs. And I remember them saying, "Elvis Presley's stepbrother is going to come," and we got in the auditorium, yeah, and we it was either Rick or David. Yeah, they yeah, both yeah, did it. yeah. It would have been Rick or David, and 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 I remember. Uh, and then it was years later when I started to piece this all together. I'm like, oh, that was one of the Stanley brothers that I'm now <laughs> friends with on Facebook. You know, I kind of put it all together. And he was in our auditorium in the school here in Manitoba. Wow. You know? So, yeah, kind of neat. The The legacy lives on. You guys yeah. uh, continue to tell the stories of your brother. And uh, I can't wait to get this book and read it. And, uh, Billy, uh, thank you I so you much. You send me your address and I'll mail you, I'll autograph a copy of the book and send it to you. How about that? Oh, uh, Billy, I, I really appreciate it. That's above and beyond. And, I, and I really I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll even sign another book. I'll send you two books so you can give one away to one of your listeners. How about that? Oh, that's fantastic. Absolutely. Consider it done. Okay. Thank well, you, Billy. Yeah, you send me really your address and I'll send you the two books. All right, Billy. You have a great day. Thanks again. Okay, Corny. Great show, buddy. Thank you yeah. for having me.